Uh, thanks so much for joining us today and welcome back to the Mountain Lion Foundation's webinar series. Um, my name is Gowan Batiste. I am the Mountain Lion Foundation's coexistence coordinator. Um, so in my work, I see a lot of lions in predicaments where they found themselves in tough places to be and also see a lot of folks working hard to live with lions and, and do it well. So I'm excited to have this conversation here today with Brent Lyles, who is our new executive director. Um, it has been really fun getting to work with Brent over the last six months or so since he joined the organization. Um, his career is focused on science, education, compassionate and inclusive leadership and environmental stewardship. Uh, he holds master's degrees in biological anthropology and not-for-profit management. Um, so Brent has uh, a long background of working with science, working with youth, working um, in advocacy for the outdoors and with nonprofits. So we're really lucky that he's here with us. So welcome, Brent. Thank you so much. I, I, that's a, a generous introduction. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. <laughs> totally. Well, to, to get right into it, um, our topic is about where are the best and the worst places to be as a mountain lion. And given that mountain lions are very adaptable animals that can live in all sorts of environments, um, what are your thoughts about what makes a place good or bad for a mountain lion to live in? Well, thank you. And before we get started, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. It's exciting to relaunch our webinar series there is a Q&A option, and as we're going through this, I, I hope folks will put their questions into that Q&A or into the chat, and we'll be able to get to some of those questions at the end. We've got some folks online here who are looking through those questions, and, and we'll, try to get, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can before our time runs out. Um, Gowan, thank you for the introduction, and you know, your question was about what makes a good place to live or a bad place to live for a mountain lion. And, at the risk of pretending like mountain lions are people, which they are not, it's interesting to note that many of the same things that affect our choices of where to live are also things that would be important to a mountain lion. So are there good spots for me to make my home? For a lion, they need a place that provides some cover for a den, plus trees or shrubs that they can hide behind when they're trying to hunt, or maybe big rocks. And especially if they're male, they'll look for territory that they can call their own, in other words, that isn't already occupied by another male lion. Can I get around easily? Lions require pretty big territory. So are there enough natural spaces that are connected to each other so that you can get around without having to cross too many big roads or highways, for instance? Is there good food available? For most mountain lions, their primary prey is deer and elk. So is there plenty of food in that area? Uh, are there potential mates available? When young males are old enough to leave home, like I say, they'll venture out and look for a territory of their own. They may find food and good habitat, but if there's no females around, they'll typically keep moving. And will I be safe? In most cases, the biggest threat to mountain lions is people. So for a mountain lion, a good place to live is a place that doesn't allow needless or ruthless killing of mountain lions. And that's all about human attitudes and values and how those values are translated into laws and regulations. As you mentioned, lions are really adaptable, so they can live in a lot of different habitats and landscapes, as long as they've got the basics, food, water, shelter, mates, and as long as they are left alone to do their mountain lion thing and live their lives. Oh, thanks so much, Brent. And, and yeah, I do wanna encourage everybody um, please use the, the Q&A. Uh, you don't need to hold your questions until the end. Um, put them in the Q&A as they come up, and that way um, we'll, we'll get to them when, when the time comes. Um, so if, if we could uh, bring up the map of the United States for a moment, um, let's look at uh, where the current populations of, of mountain lions are. Um, so you can see that the states shown here in darker gray are ones that currently have breeding populations of mountain lions, and the states in the lighter gray lack breeding populations. Um, I also want to, you know, point out to, to everybody that everywhere on, on this continent was previous mountain lion habitat. 
Um, so all across what is now the United States um, and all the way south to Patagonia, um, mountain lions either currently live or have lived. And the lighter gray doesn't mean zero mountain lion presence, it just means no breeding populations. So looking at this map, which is, is a, a huge amount of area, um, let's get the bad places to be a mountain lion out of the way. Um, so what are some of the places that we're gonna talk about that are not a great place to be a mountain lion? And how did these specific places land on the worst list? First off, let's be clear that for almost every location we'll talk about, it's, it's usually a mixed bag. They may have some characteristics that are good and some characteristics that are not so good. And, you know, for example, let's start with Utah. Great habitat, available food, and there's even a nonprofit organization in Utah, a partner of ours called Utah Mountain Lion Conservation. So there's even some people in Utah looking out for lions. In many ways, Utah should be a great place to live, but as many of our listeners probably heard on the news recently, there's a new law in Utah that goes into effect next month, opening up almost unlimited cougar hunting and trapping in that state. The Mountain Lion Foundation is going to be working hard to get that law overturned, but in the meantime, it's going to be tough going for mountain lions in Utah. Another state that's tough on mountain lions is Texas. Now, I've spent almost half my life in Texas, and I love it. Uh, I can dance a mean Texas two-step, and there are ways that Texas will always feel like home to me, so it's coming from a place of love when I say that Texas has a ways to go in terms of how we treat our mountain lions. Unlike every other state that allows cougar hunting, Texas does not consider cougars a game species. And in fact, mountain lions are classified as vermin. That's actually their legal designation, which means that lions can be killed pretty much anytime, anywhere, anyhow. When I think about places in this country that are needlessly cruel to mountain lions, Texas is right up there. <clears throat> I think it's worth noting here that our laws about mountain lions, where, wherever we live, those laws are created by people, right? And people may or may not know anything about mountain lions. There's, people may believe that mountain lions have a right to exist and that our job as humans is to strive for balance with our fellow creatures on this earth. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of misinformation out there about mountain lions, if not outright myths. Some people believe that when a cougar eats a goat, the best response is to kill it. And even if you accept that response as ethically okay, and a lot of people do not, but even if, you, if that approach is consistent with your values, the reality is that it won't work. There's a sheriff in Klickitat County, Washington, who has made headlines because he's been on a cougar killing spree. There's just no other way to describe it. And those actions, as I understand it, are driven by, one, the belief that killing those mountain lions is ethically okay, and, and two, a belief in the myth that removing cougars after a depredation event, like a cougar killing a goat, will remove the problem. And unfortunately, that myth is just plain wrong. And in fact, the opposite is true. More and more studies are showing that removing a mountain lion from its territory, especially an established male, results in the arrival, um, an influx of new, young, and inexperienced cats. And those cats are more likely to cause trouble with other goats and sheep and everything else. So, Removing a mountain lion after a goat gets killed makes the situation worse, not better. Now, unfortunately, that sheriff in Klickitat County is very likely making his community less safe, not more safe. And that's a shame. But that's what I'm talking about, right? Our laws are an extension of our beliefs, and we have the power to get educated and to help our communities and neighbors get educated and, and change the laws so that they make more sense. Whether it's Utah or Texas or Klickitat County, Washington, that's where the Mountain Lion Foundation's work comes in. It's educating people and advocating for sensible and science-based policies. Absolutely. So thank you so much for that, Brent. And in a historical context, you know, we're coming out of a very recent history of a bounty system where the states actually compensated people for going out and wholesale killing mountain lions um, with the stated goal of extermination. In, in many places. Um, and, you know, we have this remarkably resilient animal that is still here and part of the continental United States, but their populations very much can be threatened by just small changes like this. And exactly like you're saying, um, removal of adult cats 
tends to make conflict worse. And we see that over and over again in studies. It tends to trend the population younger. Um, you know, female mountain lions are not that morphologically different from male mountain lions. So even if mothers are not the goal of, of hunting and trapping, they get killed a lot and leave orphan teenagers who are way more likely to get into trouble in their attempt to feed themselves. So it drives human conflict. Um, so having, having gotten through that part, which is the not fun part, um, and let's talk about the best places to be a mountain lion. Um, so what were the criteria for this set of places? Like how high is the bar when we're talking about what um, mountain lion utopia would be? Again, what we're looking for is food, water, habitat, mates, and so on, along with safety. Places with plenty of uninterrupted terrain and abundant prey got high marks. No place is perfect, but let's talk about Washington State for a moment. I just mentioned the challenges for cougars in Klickitat County, Washington, but in general, Washington is a state with a lot of good habitat and a lot of happy lions. And while Washington currently allows more cougar hunting than we would like, it does have hunting restrictions that are tighter than most other states. Now, that being said, though, the hunting quotas vary from place to place in Washington. Uh, let's bring up that map that uh, we prepared. It's this map shows places in Washington where the state has um, increased hunting limits, which they call guidelines, hunting guidelines over the last decade or so. So if you're a cougar, just avoid the places with the red dots and you're fine. Uh, no, seriously, hunting is allowed in most parts of Washington state and the limits on hunting are significantly beyond what the science tells us will keep the cougar population stable. But there are signs of hope in Washington. The Mountain Lion Foundation has been hard at work in Washington for a while now, working with a lot of partners and volunteers, and we're beginning to see a trend towards more science-based decision-making happening at the state level, which is terrific. Now, while we've still got that map of Washington up, let's look at the Olympic Peninsula, which is along the coast on the western edge of the state, kind of the northwest part of the state. Our friends over at Panthera have a terrific research study going on the cougars in, in the Olympic Peninsula. It's great habitat, and there's lots of happy cats in that part of the state. However, and I bring this up to illustrate the complexity of what it takes to keep mountain lion populations healthy. However, the problem on the Olympic Peninsula is that it's cut off from all the other mountain lion populations. There's an enormous strip of urban development and major highways that runs north-south, and it's almost impossible for lions to get from the Olympic Peninsula across that barrier. Over time, an isolated population of cougars like the one on the Olympic Peninsula will be in trouble because it becomes inbred over time, leading to a deterioration in the population's overall. Now, the solution there is to talk about connectivity. How can we make sure that mountain lions and, and other wildlife for that matter, how can we make sure that they can travel safely from one patch of good habitat to another? One Im important solution that's getting a lot of attention these days is wildlife crossing wildlife crossings. And, and with that, I wanna to segue to California on our list of best places to live, which is doing some great work on connectivity. A little over three decades ago, the Mountain Lion Foundation helped Californians, Californians outlaw trophy hunting of mountain lions in their state. And it's the only state other than Florida, which has the endangered population of Florida panthers that doesn't allow hunting. All the other Western states allow cougar hunting. It, that, and, and that's a misconception, by the way, because a lot of people think that, oh, you know, mountain lions are protected everywhere. All states allow some level of, of hunting except for California and Florida. Now, that's a big deal that, that cougars are protected there. And while we've been talking a lot here today about science-based decision making, it is worth pointing out that the decision to outlaw hunting in California was largely an ethical one. Californians decided no. Having strict hunting guidelines, having strict hunting quotas wasn't enough. We value the existence of these animals on our landscape. We recognize the profound benefits that they bring to our ecosystems, and we don't want them killed in, in any amount. So not only does California have good habitat, plenty of food and so on, it's also got strong protections in place so that lions can live their lives free from needless persecution. There's also some effective groups on the ground in California, not just the Mountain Lion Foundation, but also our friends at the Cougar Conservancy, the Wildlife Conservation Network, and the National Wildlife Federation, looking out for the safety of the lions and, and helping people coexist with them. 
I mentioned connectivity and California is doing a ton of good work right now in terms of creating public-private partnerships to help build an infrastructure of wildlife crossings. It's a, it's a good state to live in if you're a mountain lion. I'm really, really happy to be a sheep rancher in California. Um, it's a fantastic um, model, I think, for what could happen in a lot of other states. Um, and as, as well, um, I also just wanted to give a, a short shout out to the Oakland Zoo, who's been done amazing work in taking in orphaned cougar cubs and rehabilitating them. There aren't a lot of facilities that can help an injured mountain lion. Um, they have a lot of pretty special needs um, and we happen to have a fantastic one um, at the Oakland Zoo. Um, so are there any other states that you'd like to mention or talk about? Well, every state's got its story, right? Um, let me, I'll mention a few of them. Idaho has hunting limits that are really high and uh, the result is just needless killing of cougars. Um, in Nebraska, I was just on the phone the, a, a couple of days ago with some folks in Nebraska and in that state, like in several states, the state's wildlife agency actually has an explicit goal to decrease populations of mountain lions. And that's in a state where they, there may be less than 100 cats in the state to start with. So again, it's decision making that's not based on science, it's based on myths and misinformation and on cultural goals that, that exist outside the realm of science. Um, Oregon's not too bad, plenty of great habitat, though we'd love to see some improvement in how the state thinks about its cougar populations. Um, one bright spot that I want to mention is Benton County, Oregon, where public funds have been made available to support coexistence projects like lineproof sheep pens, uh, providing livestock guardian dogs, and other non-lethal solutions and deterrents like that. That's a cool model that, that other places could learn from. Let's see, I think there's some good opportunities for lion protection on the horizon in Colorado. In South Dakota, we're seeing some success in pushing back against calls for increasing the, the quotas on cougar hunting beyond what the science says makes sense. So that's great. Um, in Nevada, one of our board members has been collecting information about the number of mountain lions that end up getting killed or mutilated by traps that are set out for other species, which is called incidental trapping. Um, it's, and it's just horrific. Uh, it's inexcusable and needless cruelty. Um, also in Nevada, as well as in Arizona and New Mexico and across the Southwest, lion populations are becoming more vulnerable to heat stress and drought from climate change. So anyway, there's plenty of work to be done across the country, but you know, I'm really heartened by the number of people that are standing up for cats these days. I, I definitely see the numbers growing and that gives me a tremendous amount of hope. Which is really fantastic. And of course, like part of that is the new science coming out on all the benefits of, of having mountain lions in the uh, landscape. And, you know, benefits to uh, the ecosystem overall as a keystone species that has a huge number of species interaction and increases biodiversity everywhere they are, but also to humans. And it's specifically South Dakota. There's a fantastic study showing that mountain lions reduce the deer population enough in South Dakota that they save the state about $1.2 million a year and several avoided deaths from reduction in vehicle strikes. You know, South Dakota only has around 800,000 people. You know, if you apply that to a state like California with over 30 million people, you know, you really kind of start to see the power of, of how important they are as a, um, as a species. Um, so let's bring up a map of potential cougar habitat in the eastern half of the United States. Um, this map came from a New York article by Dr. Mark Elbrock a couple of months ago, in which he made the point that lions are heading eastward, and he said we should be welcoming them. So Brent, what are your thoughts about that? Is the eastern United States a good place to live if you're a mountain lion? I think Dr. Elbrock's point in the New York Times is that these spots in the Eastern US could be good places to live, but they're not there yet. Here at the Mountain Lion Foundation, we get calls all the time from folks who think they've seen a mountain lion in a place where we know there aren't any breeding populations. Lots of times it's a case of mistaken identity, like a bobcat or a coyote, or even a big 
short haired dog with a long tail, but, but sometimes it's legit. Um, some young male mountain lions will travel hundreds of miles when they disperse from their home to find a new territory. And so it does happen. There were news reports about a cougar in Illinois not that long ago. But unfortunately for these cats, one of the criteria we mentioned earlier was being able to find a mate, right? When these young males start traveling like that to Eastern states where there aren't any females, they just don't find any mates. And so that's also why the cats that turn up in Illinois don't usually stick around in the same spot for more than a few days. They'll just keep on moving. Um, the most famous example is from about 10 or 12 years ago, I think, when a mountain lion that started in South Dakota, believe it or not, traveled almost 2,000 miles and was eventually killed on a road in Connecticut. So it is, it is exciting indeed that mountain lions are moving east and returning to the habitats that they used to live in quite happily. Which is really exciting for a number of reasons. You know, there's there's some emerging research showing that mountain lions specifically seek out individual deer afflicted by Lyme disease and chronic wasting disease. It could be more effective than targeted hunting at removing those individuals from a population. Um, there's all sorts of reasons to be excited about mountain lions heading east. But yeah, part of what we as the Mountain Lion Foundation are here to do is help people who've never lived with mountain lions before learn what that, uh, what those tools are and how to do that. Um, because it is a different skill set. You know, when mountain lions move into the neighborhood, there's things you need to know. Um, so we're here for that. Um, if we have people on the East Coast, reach out to us. Um, so I know that everyone listening is, already anxious to figure out what they can do to keep good habitat good for mountain lions and make unsuitable habitats better. So before we head into our Q&A, can you share a few suggestions? As you've been mentioning, Gallen, everything we've been talking about today is central to the work of the Mountain Lion Foundation. Our mission is to make sure that cougars survive and thrive, which means that we're out there saving cats wherever we can. We don't do this work alone. We need the help of partnering organizations and like-minded individuals in every state. For the folks that are out there listening to this, you're probably already on our mailing list and, and following us on social media. So here's what you can do. Watch for those calls to action. When you see them, don't just take action, and we hope you'll do that, but an incredibly important thing that you can do is share those action alerts with your friends and family and colleagues and neighbors. Speaking personally, I actually just got a call for act, call to action from another organization, totally different cause, but it came from a friend of mine, right? And it was a personal note saying, hey, we need your help on this. And I'm so much more inclined to take action when it's a friend of mine, because I know this person and I know they care about it, right? So that makes an impact. And so for the folks that are listening right now, keep that in mind. When you see those action alerts, those calls to action, come out from the Mountain Lion Foundation, whether it's through our emails or through social media or whatever, pass those along. It really, it really makes a difference. Um, <clears throat> when there's opportunities to do something meaningful for mountain lions in your area, you'll be the first to know. So please help us spread the word. You'd be amazed how much of a difference a hundred letters from concerned citizens can make. Uh, this movement is growing. So let's all do what we can to turbocharge it. Let's, let's save America's lions. Thanks so much, Brent. And thanks for bearing with me because I am on a sheep ranch. So there's stock dogs in the background and use calling and all manner of stuff. Um, but, you know, as we kind of have these conversations and, and they're emerging, it's, it's really important just to, to remind everybody that, you know, we're a membership organization. You can sign up, you can volunteer. We want to hear from you. And also that we're here to provide support and you can reach out to us. People uh, call us and email us with questions all the time. You know, my inbox is often full of paw prints and poop with the people who, um, you know, just want to know what, uh, how to both how to keep themselves safe and keep their animals safe, and also you know understand the ecosystem that they're living in. Um, so we're here for that, and and please um, reach out to us. And um, so as we open up the the Q and A here, um, 
check this out. Um, this is a fantastic question I would like to start with um, from Linda, um, which is that lions are moving with climate change. So is action being taken to protect lions where they're headed, um, like the Midwest? So we talked about lions moving east a little bit. So I, I think just to, to talk about, you know, what are we doing to protect lions as they're migrating? Because um, obviously in that most famous case, you know, this lion traveled almost 2,000 miles only to be struck by a car. Um, so what can the Eastern United States do um, in preparation for the mountain lions that are moving east? That's a great question. And I, I there's there's kind of two pieces to this question, or, or at least two pieces to my answer that I'd like to provide. One of them is to acknowledge that the changes to our ecosystems that 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 are coming with climate change are being felt very acutely in the American Southwest, but they are having an impact everywhere, right, globally. And I guess it's good news, bad news in a way, in, in, in terms of mountain lions, the good news is that they're actually very adaptable animals. And so as the climate changes, mountain lions can adapt to those changes more quickly than a lot of other species can. And so, you know, as we talk about animals that are going to be specifically impacted by those changes directly, mountain lions do have some resiliency there. Now, that being said, mountain lions need food and water. And many times the prey species of mountain lions will be very much affected by those habitat changes. And we're seeing that across the American West right now. And I know that state agencies are wrestling with this idea of, of making sure that we can have healthy ecosystems, we can still have deer on the landscape as the habitats change. And I know that a lot of state agencies are putting a lot of time and energy and money into habitat restoration. And so the more that that can happen, the better. And that's not just going to benefit mountain lions, it's going to benefit all of the ecosystems of North America, right? So, so that's part one of my answer. And then, and then part two is 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 the mention of the eastward spread of mountain lions and i'm glad you asked this because one of the things i wanted to mention earlier and forgot was that as mountain lions move we need to be looking at what are the policies for those mountain lions in those states before the mountain lions get there right eventually there will be breeding populations in some of those eastern states and in fact some folks are actually talking about reintroduction although that's probably a long ways off right now. Those are just conversations as far as I know, but as mountain lions and especially breeding populations of mountain lions start appearing in those states, what are the policies? Are, are they arriving in a state where there are protections? And what can we be doing as the Mountain Lion Foundation and our partners and our members, what can we be doing now to make sure that those states are welcoming to those mountain lions and that will provide some protection? Um, fantastic. And there's actually a follow-up question, um, uh, which is, would the Mountain Lion Foundation support the introduction of cats to the east, or would we prefer the cats to reintroduce themselves? Um, and so since since we were, you mentioned reintroduction, um, what I wanted to throw in there is that there have been reintroduction efforts for genetically isolated populations in Florida. Um, where some female mountain lions were actually airdropped from Texas into Florida um, and allowed to breed in this critically genetically isolated population, and then actually picked back up and taken back to Texas. Um, so there is precedent for that, um, but I don't currently know of any reintroduction plans, and I think most biologists would prefer they reintroduce themselves. But do you have any thoughts about that, Brent? You know, it, it, we could probably have an entire webinar just on reintroduction, right, and what that means. I mean, there's been, there are a lot of lessons learned right now from wolf reintroduction across the American West. Um, several states have had successful wolf re reintroduction, and, and those um, arrivals of wolves in those states are often very beneficial for the ecosystems and for food webs and that kind of thing. And so, as we talk about reintroduction in Eastern states, 
it's those benefits that 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 um, get us excited about the idea, not just being able to have the mountain lions there, but also the benefits that they would bring to those ecosystems. And of course, the, I mean, it's really complicated, right? And if it, you know, it very quickly involves politics and money and, and things like that. So, um, you know, let's just leave it as this. If mountain lions were to be reintroduced into some of those states, I, I think we would very quickly see the benefits from having their uh, participation in the food webs. Right. I, I think one of the hard parts about measuring their benefits is that they're so elusive that it's, uh, you know, they avoid humans so much that we tend to benefit from the good work that they do without actually acknowledging them for it. Um, so places like South Dakota are really great for that, actually, because we can see the change when they have been absent and then they come back in. Um, so there's a question from Flo here, um, which is, what do you think is the best way to spread awareness without making people feel like you're attacking their way of life? Um, like some hunters and ranchers. Um, that's of course something I have a lot of thoughts about because that's my area of work in the Mountain Lion Foundation. Um, but I, I will refer that question to another question that, that we had about grazing land and agricultural fields. And are those landscapes good uh, landscapes for mountain lions? And, you know, so, you know, with having studied agriculture in, in college and worked on a lot of organic large scale crop farms and growing up in ranching and now being in ranching, um, agricultural crop fields are not good mountain lion <laughs> habitat. <laughs> and it's often a piece that doesn't get discussed as much in conservation. Um, so to answer your question flow, I would say, I think that there's an overemphasis on hunters and ranchers and an underemphasis on city planners and crop farmers <laughs> um, because habitat removal you know, removal of prey, um, removal of cover is one of the biggest issues that is, is impacting whether or not a mountain lion can live somewhere. When I'm approaching ranchers who I know are likely to be hostile to me, I tend to approach them as a peer and also, you know, say to them, look, look, I'm here to make your business work. You know, I'm here to help you learn how to navigate the laws that exist. I'm here to keep your animals safe. Trapping, um, or shooting a mountain lion after the fact is, is reactive, right? Your animal's already dead. Proactive coexistence keeps your animal from being killed in the first place. So, you know, we have a, a net outcome of more living animals, right? Which is ultimately what most ranchers want. And I definitely think that there can be a misconception in conservation um, that we're anti-ranching. Um, and that we're anti-hunting, you know, like I grew up in a hunting family. Um, you know, I am a rancher. We've had many people on staff who have similar backgrounds and um, ranches really can be refugia for all sorts of, of um, native species, including mountain lions. We have fantastic game camera footage of a very healthy mountain lion walking right through a ranch. Um, never had any, you know, livestock losses, but the lions are present. So I think that approaching them as partners and understanding that one of the things that ranching often does is keep large tracts of land open and undeveloped. And that's actually something mountain lions really need. You know, we can start in including them and acknowledging the good work that they do and then start solving the problems of, you know, they're wanting to keep their bottom line and keep their animals alive too. And we want that as well. Um, so like Brent, do you have any thoughts about that when, when you have to talk to people that are, you know, coming at this stuff from a really different perspective, like how do you usually approach it? Well, first off, thanks for your thoughts on that gal. And I, I appreciate it. And I think the mountain lion foundation is an, enormously lucky to have you on staff and to have that ranching perspective in house. I think it's, it makes a huge, huge difference. There is, I, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm not even sure where to start. When I was attending a conference last fall, I had just started at the Mountain Lion Foundation. I attended a speaker, uh, uh, there was a, one of the keynote speakers, was a woman that, and I I'm, I'm, wish I could remember her name off the top of my head. Um, she was an indigenous hunter and was speaking about 
her family's tradition and her community's tradition of hunting and the values that, that come with that and the ethics that come with that and the, the place of herself as a hunter in the food web, in the ecosystem, in the natural order. And I was incredibly moved by it. Um, and I bring that up because we live in a time where politics are really divisive. And unfortunately, a lot of the work that we do as the Mountain Lion Foundation gets labeled before we even open our mouths, right? And I, I, when I come into these conversations, what I try to do is understand, first have an understanding of my own value system and where I'm coming from, and then to sort of, what I try to do, I, you know, some days I'm more successful than others, right? But what I try to do is check my ego at the door and say, what are your value systems, right? What are, what are, if I'm talking to someone, what are you coming to the table with and what are your values? And, and I am someone who believes that solutions can be crafted if people from different perspectives and different backgrounds and different value sets are working together. It's not easy, it's messy. And, and, and there's ways to move forward in groups and, and coalitions like that, 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 that have you know, strange bedfellows, right? Um, and it takes longer, but hopefully, ultimately, the goal is stronger because of it. Um, you know, it, we, we, we very quickly, especially because of the political devices of Venice right now, we very quickly fall into this us and them attitude. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's moving things forward. And if I can just add one more thing to this, I know there's lots of questions, but if, there, if I can add one more thing to this, I wanna make the connection to a movement that's happening right now to reform how state wildlife agencies uh, conduct their business. And I'm referring specifically to the commissions that, that exist in every state that typically oversee or guide or work in partnership with the state agency. And, and often it's the state agency and those commissions that are making decisions about mountain lions. Now, the changes that are happening are, are kind of amazing. They kind of blow my mind because the idea is that rather than having a commission and the people on the commission represent one narrow set of values, the idea is to have those commissions be more reflective of the diversity of values in the public and to recognize uh, that climate change is happening, right? Like it's, it's, this isn't just about how do we make sure there's enough deer on the landscape? This is about how do we make sure our ecosystems are healthy across the state? Um, and it's a really exciting movement. It's a it's it's um, an exciting development. And I see this question is fitting right into that, right? Because what we want for state agencies is to have those different to have those different perspectives at the table. Um, and 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 that's inclusive, not exclusive, right? That's it's it's a it's coming at this from a place of inclusion and equity. Fantastic. And. I couldn't agree more, and it's um, it's one of the exciting things about um, uh, it's one of the most exciting things about being in this really dynamic uh, field. Is there's there's so so much going on, and and people of all different walks of life are involved. Um, so there's a question from Cassandra: um, What actions are being done by our organization? and helping overturn the new amendment in Utah that threatens our cougars. So we, we mentioned that it's something that we're working actively on. So um, how, how do we go about doing something like that? And uh, Cassandra says, um, I live in Centerville. I'm in school for a wildlife conservation degree and I'm deeply concerned. What can I do to help? Would starting a petition like on change.org be helpful or effective at all in this fight? Well, first of all, let me say, please be in touch with us, right? As, as we move forward and we start working on overturning these laws in Utah, we're gonna need all the help we can get. And, and please, please talk to us. Let's, let's keep in touch and let's work on this together. Right now, the law that was uh, signed by the governor, um, gosh, four or five weeks ago now, will go into effect next month. 
there are efforts underway right now. And we're, so, so right now the Mountain Lions Foundation, Mountain Lion Foundation's role is, is kind of talking and communicating and coordinating with different parties that are involved with this stuff. So it's, there's a lot of moving pieces. The idea right now is to hopefully limit how this law gets applied, right? Because once the law is created, then the regulations follow from that law. And, 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 and we wanna make sure that if possible, mountain lion protections appear in those regulations as much as possible. So that's where it's at right this second. Now, once the law has gone into effect and the, and the dust kind of settles on this lawmaking and rulemaking process, then the real work, or I should say a different phase of the work will begin. And again, Mountain Lion Foundation has some partners on the ground in, in Utah. One of the things that's really interesting about that, about how this has played out is that there are very um, influential and prominent hunting groups in Utah that also oppose this law and that would like to see much tighter restrictions on mountain lion hunting and, and trapping. And, you know, are there opportunities for the Mountain Lion Foundation to find partners whose goals we align with? And, and you know, we may not agree on this, we may not agree on that, but here's something right in front of us that maybe we do agree on. And, and is there a way for us to move forward in that way? Fantastic, yeah. So I, I just, I, you know, unfortunately for the moment, it's kind of like have patience and we'll get there. And, you know, over the next few months, I think we'll have some better answers about next steps. Right. Awesome. And so, because um, since we're talking about the Southwest, um, from Linda, um, is the best thing we can do for lions in Arizona um, or in, you know, the other arid states to stop taking all of their water? And um, I had a really quick um, thought about that. Um, which is really, um, you know, water diversion for cropland can be a problem for mountain lions as well as for municipal use because in drought years, where goes the irrigation go the prey animals. Um, there's a photo that I, I typically use in my um, presentations on coexistence from Nevada that shows a bunch of bighorn sheep lounging around on a golf course. Um, so when conditions are, are, are really dry and there's not great feed for ruminants, um, they will come where humans are irrigating and then that will bring mountain lions closer to people. And um, unfortunately coming closer to people, you know, people are some of the biggest threats to mountain lions. So yes, and you know, water policy, you know, drought years um, are always pretty dangerous years for mountain lions. Um, but we can ameliorate that by just raising awareness of the fact that, you know, it, we're having a drought year deer, bighorn sheep, elk are going to come where the irrigation is. And that means that we need to be more aware of our coexistence um, work because it's going to be a, a, high, a high encounter year. Um, so let's see, there's, I, I actually feel really overwhelmed by the Q&A. There are so many great questions. Can I add a thought to what you're Absolutely. just going to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that affect the health of mountain lions and affect the health of North America's ecosystems. Right? It can be really overwhelming for us. You're talking about overwhelming, but being overwhelmed by the questions right now, kind of the, on a daily basis, we're having to make decisions about how we, how we engage with issues and, and, and what we can do. Certainly water policy across the American West has an impact on mountain lions. Another thing that has a big impact that we're, trying to keep an eye on is how development happens across the American West, right? Habitat loss, habitat fragmentation. These are huge issues, not just for mountain lions, but for natural spaces in general. And, you know, maybe it's worth noting here that for, for some of those West Coast states, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington, you're starting to see some policies that limit how development happens. And that's all about climate change, right? It's all about making sure that our, our future uh, builds, you know, our, our future development builds in efficiency and effectiveness in terms of energy use, um, you know, transportation, right? Um, and, and, and those things, even though, you know, in, in the moment it may be, well, development policy, what does that have to do with mountain lions? It actually, in the big picture, has a lot to do with mountain lions. And so, um, you know, 
shout outs to the folks who are working in those areas as well. And, 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 and we do try to keep track of that and partner where we can and support great legislation where we can. Fantastic. And on the topic of legislation, um, who are the best people to write to in Washington state to lobby for better protection and for wildlife corridors in our state? Well, your representatives, right? First of all, you want to make sure that you know who the folks representing you in the legislature are. And then, uh, you know, in terms of committee assignments, I don't know the names off the top of my head, but there are certain committees that deal with the different issues, right? And so figuring out which committees are taking on that particular issue and then who's serving on that committee. And, and, and what you're hoping for is that one of the folks that represents you is serving on that committee because then that gives you a voice directly into those issues. Fantastic. So there's another question. Um, will mountain lions be aggressive to people without people being aggressive to them? Um, and I think that that's, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, right. And, and, you know, I guess it has a little bit to do with where's good to live and where's bad to live. Um, if I can make the connection just for a moment to the story of P-22 in the Los Angeles area, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, I think most of the folks listening will know that P-22 is a mountain lion that died recently, but had been living for about 10 or 12 years in Griffith Park in Los Angeles, which is a heavily traveled park. I mean, it is, it, or I should say heavily visited park. Um, it's one of the apparently one of the busiest municipal parks in the country. And here's a mountain lion that that lived there in a very small territory. It's much smaller than most mountain lion territories for 10 years, almost without incident. Now, this is a den it's heavily visited park within a very densely populated area. And for me, one of the great lessons of P22's story is that a lot of coexistence, you know, sometimes we get caught up in, well, what do you have to do to coexist with mountain lions? But at the end of the day, a big part of it is just leave the mountain lions alone and they're not gonna bother you. Mountain lions are very elusive creatures. And the reason we as humans call them elusive is because they don't hang out where, you know, like they don't wanna be with us. <laughs> they wanna avoid us whenever they can. And, and P22, you know, uh, until the very end of his life when he was sick and had been hit by a car multiple times and, and was, I mean, he was on his last legs for a number of different ways. Like, you know, until that very, those very last days when his behavior started changing, you know, here's a mountain lion that lived in very close proxim proximity to a lot of people totally safely and, and without incident. And in fact, became a bit of a local hero along the way. Fantastic. And, you know, I think it, P22 is a perfect, illustration of that. And I, I would also add that, you know, aggressiveness is kind of a spectrum and that mountain lions are actually, you know, at least as afraid of us as we are uh, of them. And so people who encounter a mountain lion might encounter, you know, if, if they surprise each other, they might see bluff behavior, you know, um, hissing, spitting, you know, paw, paw dust swiping. And all of those are, are actually not a, aggression, but um, it's a bluff. And that's a very scared cat that's, that's trying to get you to not, not eat it. Um, so when, you know, when people encounter mountain lions and they sometimes interpret behavior as aggressive, um, that is, is not hunting behavior and is not fighting behavior, but is, is fear, you know? And what we tell people is just slowly increase your distance stay big, you know, defend your space. Um, and most times, you know, both the mountain lion and the person can walk away. And um, so there are many more fantastic questions um, that we are not gonna have time for. I really wanna encourage people who have burning questions, who have thoughts that were accessible, especially if you have a coexistence related question. There were some in the Q&A that were specifically coexistence focused that I, I didn't pull out because that while that's my specific interest, that's, you know, less of less of what this topic was focused on. But please email me. I would be more than happy 
to discuss the stuff with you. And we have a whole bunch of experts on staff that love getting questions and um, people, people will, you know, be happy to discuss mountain lion stuff with, with you if you reach out. And um, so thank you so much, everybody for joining us. And um, everybody is going to get a recording of this. And um, if you've registered for this webinar, you'll um, hopefully get an alert for the next in our series because we are picking this back up. So um, our next, uh, our next topic uh, our next couple of topics are going to be really fantastic. So predators, pests, and power on May 17th, and then trail cams for conservation on June 21st. Um, both uh, a lot of great stuff there. So thank you so much, Brent. Thank you. Um, terrific. I really appreciate the chance to have this conversation. It's a lot of fun. Totally. It's It's been a really, really great time. And thank you so much to everybody who registered and for your fantastic, fantastic questions. That's definitely like a dream Q&A. Um, really appreciate you. Yeah, and thanks so much to Lace and Chelsea who have been running um, the behind the scenes for all of us. Yep, with, it, with that, we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everybody.